and um, the group of Samaritans Theater. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm always happy to have an opportunity to talk about something that I think is very important, which is people's <coughs> access to information. Uh, I think almost all of you have probably grown up with access uh, to libraries, which is one of the main ways in which people have access to information because libraries have books, so you can get information that goes back centuries, even millennia. Um, libraries have uh, different uh, opinions on uh, our current reality, what our future might look like, what has happened in the past. Libraries are full of arguments, so you can hear opinions that are different from your own, you can hear arguments that reinforce how you feel or what your belief system is. You can uh, find yourself in a library, you can know yourself more, you can choose to ask because you go to a library and the library provides you with um, all this information. So uh, the idea that whole lots of people in this world don't have similar information should be really frightening, um, even to those who have information, because I think it was Martin Luther King who said uh, something about in injustice to someone else um, can uh, have an impact in the kind of uh, the kind of access to justice that you have. So when I say I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk about libraries and access to information. I'm actually uh, glad to talk about uh, access to justice because information and access to information is one uh, aspect of building just societies. So <clears throat> according to the structure of this talk, I'm gonna start just by talking about the actual library, then a little bit about how and why it works, and finally the context um, in which we have built these libraries, and that context, going back to my opening remarks, is that there are a lot of libraries in this country. This country has around 1.3 billion people. All of these people not having access to information has direct effect on everybody else, whether they have access to information like you do, or don't have access to information. We're all in this together. So, we have an organization called the Community Library Project. Interestingly, about 10 years ago in 2010, a group of uh, fifth graders, I think by now they probably graduated and are in college or um, possibly older. These 10-year-olds uh, were part of uh, meeting a group of 10-year-olds somewhere else in Delhi. And that somewhere else is a community called Sheikh Sarai in South Delhi. And uh, some 10-year-olds there and some 10-year-olds here, uh, Mr. Creighton was part of this project, got together to create a library in Sheikh Sarai, inside a school. For some three or four years, that library ran as a school library, which meant were previously in a school with about 500 people, where there had been no library. Now, once a week, every child could have a library period and go get a book uh, borrow it, read it, return it the next week. Maybe if they were really into it, they might have exchanged books with each other during that week so that maybe a child might have had two books that week instead of one. This was a pretty good deal. It went on for a few years. The school shut down and in 2015, because we were part of creating that library, I was, a handful of other people were, and then the kids I mentioned, the AES kids, as part of a project they did for their class, um, and, and the kids in the school, because they didn't have a library and they were interested to create one, uh, all of us had created this library, and in 2015, that library was lying empty and unused. It had about 3,000 books in it. We actually started thinking, as we saw the dust gather on the books, that this is a tragedy and we need to send these books to other places. And I think some five, six hundred books were picked up to other places. When we woke up, and sometimes in life it's like this, things come a little late to you. And it came a little late to us that, hey, what if we didn't give these books away? Some of that was because we were having trouble giving the books away. 
We couldn't find libraries that wanted to take the books. We weren't sure when people took the books if they were going to read it, if other people were going to have access to the books, where were these books going, how was it going to work? Because again, there were so few libraries. So uh, in 2015, we decided uh, to open the door to this library, to dust everything off, and to hang up a sign. And from day one, the library that we opened in 2015 was free, and it was open to all. Some of those children who used to come and borrow a book once a week could now come. Uh, right now, the library is open seven days a week. It took us a little while to get here, about three years. So around 2018, we became a seven-day-a-week library. And they can come all day, all seven days, all day long. Till some days were open till 7 p.m. and some days till 5.30. Uh, they can come in after school. They can come in before school. Some kids in Delhi go to school in the morning shift, so they go to school, they arrive at school at 7.30, and they study till 1.30. Other kids go to school at 12.30 in the afternoon, and they study till about 6.30. And it's usually gender with the boys going in the afternoon to the evening session, and the girls going in the morning session. These are the schools run by the government, and they're pretty much free. I mean, there's a few small costs associated with it, but mostly it's pretty free. And those are the kids who mostly use this community library that is free and open to all. Uh, at this point, the original grant in Sheikh Sarai uh, is open seven days a week. It doesn't cost anything. Anyone can come in any day. And we have around 2,800 members, uh, of which I don't think um, these days it's not even quite 50%, maybe around uh, 1,000 to 1,200 people are actually using the library. The others used it and left. Some have, some have moved out of Delhi. Some have stopped coming into the library because um, um, maybe they lost a book and they got scared that if they've lost a book, they're not allowed to use the library anymore. Uh, others have stopped coming because maybe a family member is sick and uh, maybe you know, you're 14 years old or 13 years old and now it's your job to take care of your siblings because mom is sick. And mom is sick could last a month or more. Um, so I think you live in, living in Delhi, you're aware that there are all kinds of people living in Delhi. The around 21 million people who live in the uh, national capital region of which New Delhi is a part, that uh, these folks come, uh, many of them from all over the country, the vast, vast majority of them uh, live uh, in, in the lowest income level uh, anywhere in India, which means they may only be earning uh, a few thousand rupees, maybe four or five or six thousand rupees a month, maybe even as much as 10,000 rupees a month, which isn't quite $200 in the US for a whole month. Um, so a free library means that you can come in and use it and not pay anything at all. If you've lost a book in our library, one of our best practices is that you can come in uh, one day a week uh, and work off that debt, which is not the equivalent of the money value of the book, because from the beginning, free means we've decided that books should not have money attached to them. So everything you own, everything you wear, getting your hair cut, the food you eat. And this school costs a lot of money. That's called monetizing something. You put a monetary value on it. Pretty much our entire world is now organized on this principle that things cost money and we buy and sell to one another. Um, people say things like time costs money. Some people say relationships cost money. In our library, we've decided to run this experiment and to say that books uh, do not and should not cost money. That if somebody wrote something that they thought was important in the 14th century, and then the people in the 15th and 16th and 17th and 18th until this day have thought it was important enough to read it and to keep it alive so that it arrived here today. And if it still has value, Perhaps that value is not about the money you can ascribe to it. 
So not only does free, which is one of the best practices which makes our library successful, which makes it possible for anybody in Delhi to walk into the library, not only does it make it possible for someone to come in because they don't have money, it also means that if you lose the book, uh, we don't say, oh, it costs 350 rupees, you need to work the equivalent of 350 rupees. Instead, we say forgiveness is a right, and you can come in and ask for your right, which is the right to be forgiven for doing the very human thing of making a mistake and losing your book or dropping it into a muddy puddle. And um, everyone who makes mistakes doesn't just want to be forgiven, they want to do something right. I've made a mistake, I would like to do something right. So in our library, really little kids who are four or five years old may come in with a sibling and help in the library for an hour. Someone who's a little bit older might help for two hours, someone who's your age um, would work for the maximum number of hours in the library that anybody um, helps, which is three hours. During that three hours, there's snack time, there's independent reading time, because that's part of the work of creating a library reading. All those books that elsewhere in the world have a monetary value that we have decided does not have a monetary value, all those books have a value which is the potential to be able to read them. The ideas inside, the brand new ideas, the 14th century ideas, ideas about what girls are, what boys are, what women are, what men are, uh, what class is, what caste is, these ideas are really powerful ideas. Ideas that say some people are superior to others, ideas that say, no, we're all around the same. Um, ideas that say this world is not good the way it is, and ideas that argue for changing the world. These are powerful ideas. So if you are in the library repairing your membership because you lost a book or dropped a book into mud, maybe um, the act of reading adds value to that book. And the act of uh, reading in the library adds value to the reading. So one of the best practices in our library is free. The other best practice is open to all. Um, a repair day, a day you can come and correct a mistake you made and be forgiven uh, is a best practice. The fact that the library has open shelves, which your library does, it, it doesn't have, you don't have to open a door to get to the book. The shelf is open, even if like dust may end up on the book, the shelf is open, and the librarian and other people are dedicated to keeping it clean and keeping it open. Um, so open shelves is a best practice. Uh, free choice, which means somebody isn't saying to you, you don't know how to read. Why are you taking this book? Or you're only, you know, 13 years old, you shouldn't read those adult books. Those are not good for you. Um, or maybe you're young and you're being told um, that it's time for you to take a study book because this is the time in your life to study. Uh, so free choice is against all of that. It's, it's an argument for you being able to choose what interests you and pursuing that curiosity and interest may be dropping it and picking another interest. So our library shelves are open. There is free choice to members. And we have done something quite uh, uh, radical, even I think in the context of other libraries that are free and open to all, and that have open shelving and free choice. We've also decided that librarians can be people who know more about members than they know about books. <laughs> So our librarians are often people <coughs> your age who may not have, uh, at age 13 or 14 or 15, a library science degree. But they may know a lot about people their own age and their interests. And they may know a lot about how those young people who uh, live next door to them or go to the same school they do are struggling to come inside the library. And so they make excellent librarians because when they sit behind the circulation desk or when they do that other best practice which we have, which is leave the circulation desk and even leave the library and go in the neighborhood or go in the school and go door knocking and say, I'm in a free library and I want to welcome you to come to that library. 
So they make excellent librarians because when they do this, the person who opens the door, the person who is their aide, their own classmate says, hey, I know you. You have a library and it's free. I think I'll come there tomorrow. And I mean, that sounds kind of funny and maybe that, those are not the exact words that person is thinking, but we are a huge resource <coughs> for libraries. We issue these days on average in that first branch, and we have two other branches and yet another one coming up. On average, we issue about 100 books a day. Some days we issue about 150. There's at least 200 or more people every single day in the library. If they're not borrowing a book, maybe they're just sitting in the reading room. The reading room itself is like a fraction of the size of this room, but the homes of members who use our library, or at least a majority of the members who use our library, um, the homes are even smaller than that reading room. So the reading room really matters as a space to read. It also really matters because the stuff I said about the best practice of a librarian who is a young member of the library, um, you need a physical space in which you can see that member. You also need to see all the other members in the library. The banner that wraps around our library on the inside has about uh, 1,500 names on it, which is all the people who have read at least 10 books. Next to some names, there are three or five or 10 stars. Each star represents 10 books read. So again, that physical space to see all these people, maybe 20 or 30 in the room with you, the 1,500 whose names are on the wall, is encouragement to, uh, and, and it, it is part of that warm welcome, uh, which says to you, that you belong here and you belong in reading. So the final thing I can tell you, the, the phenomenal success of our library, uh, the three tiny branches and all these best practices, they occur in a context which I had said very briefly in the beginning, is a context in which Delhi does not have very many libraries. 21 million people and 35 branches. Uh, we need around a thousand branches to serve these 21 million people. Overall, in India, there's maybe at best 35,000 to 55,000 libraries that people can access that are run by governments that are semi-free. They require security deposits, deposits and they fine you if you lose the book. Semi-free. Um, the 55,000 uh, libraries, if they even exist, are a fraction of the one million that needs to exist in India for people to have access to information, for people to have access to justice. Why don't we have the libraries? Is it an accident? Did somebody forget to create libraries? We wrote an excellent constitution and we live in one of the largest democracies in the world. Access to information is what makes a good citizen and a good human being because then you can make good decisions about the kind of society you want to be in. It's not an accident. We have an education system that is designed to prepare people to work in society as it is. The education system is inherited from a history of being a colonized country. I'll wrap up in one minute. In a colonized country, uh, the people who are colonized serve the interests of those who are doing the colonizing. India was colonized by British. The British. So everything that happened in India, all the people who worked, all the raw materials, resources, the brain power, was designed to make a good life for people in Britain. And a not great life for people in India. We inherited the education system they designed to make this happen. And to some large extent, we still think um, and elsewhere in the world also, I would argue, education, you guys are part of an education system, you need to examine to what extent does any education system simply recreate the inegalitarian, unequal, some people serving the needs of other people, um, societies in which we live. Colonialism was one factor here. We also have a class and caste system in India that has created a very hierarchical society. So the education system serves that hierarchy. The government school education is not the same quality as the private school education. The pedagogy, the curriculum, and the access to free information, free choice, 
and thinking um, through, through access to that powerful tool of thinking, which is books. Uh, by limiting that access, we, we reinforce hierarchy. We reinforce inequality. So I would say the lack of libraries in this country is not an accident. And what we're doing in our library is pushing against um, very powerful forces that would like to keep it going.